Hi guys, welcome to the Astro Dude. In today's video, we're going to be interviewing Miguel Gurea, who is it, who is the founder of Mars Direct 3.0. He's also studied aerospace engineering and is now studying economics. But, bef but before we get into this interview, there's a high probability that you are not subscribed. So make sure to press that subscribe button and leave a like. Since there's no reason not to, at least, at least I don't think so. So, anyways, let's get into the interview. Okay, we're recording, and we have uh, Miguel Guerrero on here. Yes, hello. It's Guerrero. It's a, a tricky Spanish. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't, don't worry. It's a nice try. <laughs> sorry, how is it pronounced? Guerrero. Guerrero. Yeah, that's. That's good enough. <laughs> it, it's kind of tricky. Yeah, no problem. So uh, tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and how you got interested in science and engineering and where you got educated. Sure. Uh, well, uh, as I just kind of um, told you, I'm from Spain. And I, I got into space at age five, more or less, when my parents, I was actually prepared for this question. They bought me this particular book about space. And uh, I used to kind of just read, and I, I, I used to, I used to stare at this one particular picture of the entire solar system. Uh, here, and I was fascinated by by this page. And then I got some other books, and I kind of abandoned the topic, not entirely, but you know, not learning too much until and, um, at age more or less fifteen. I started to, you know, through YouTube, start, uh, I started to learn a lot of science from, you know, physics and all that stuff uh, from good science communicators. And it started rolling. And yeah, I actually went and tried to study aerospace engineering. I went to the UK because uh, I, I got uh, decent grades. Uh, and I found that it was not exactly the right thing for me and a bunch of other things um, combined. So I, I dropped that one. And I'm now studying economics in my hometown in Santander. Uh, yeah, I'm studying economics. I'm a second year st economics student right now. That's kind of my background in very short. Uh, why do you think Mars is a great place to expand human civilization? <clears throat> well, the, you can uh, do this in the kind of optimistic hopeful way or in the kind of bad pessimistic one and the result is the same um the, the pessimistic bad one is because there isn't any place that's better or as good uh it's basically even if it's bad it's the only thing we got and in the hopeful way because you know that it has decent gravity uh it's not toxic or it's doable Basically, it's it's dual. It's like if you're playing a video game, uh, you can just uh, you can't just start in the max level uh, difficulty because you're not you're not gonna do very well. So thankfully, in our solar system, uh, you know we kind of played a roulette. Obviously, uh, we had to have one planet that was great, which is the Earth. Otherwise, we would not exist. But that does not determine the other options. Like we we could have gotten many different other combinations of solar systems and planets and we got this one which is not bad um one th good thing that mars has it, it has less gravity not more it's a lot easier to adapt to less gravity than more gravity because if, if instead of mars we had kind of a super earth with like 1.5 earth's gravity we would, we would die living there i'm not sure we would die but we it would be very painful um so that would not be an option but Low gravity is kind of fine. Also, the, the day, the duration of the day is similar. Um, minerals can be extracted. The atmosphere is CO2, which can be turned to different kinds of, kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, we have the so, challenges. Of, um, I cannot, was, I just lost my thought. Yeah, we have the challenge of oxygen, obviously, because it, basically oxygen is only stable in the atmospheres as far as we know. If there, if there's life, so assuming that there is life in all planets, then 
the only way to get life is to get oxygen, sorry, is if there's life. So uh, that's one thing we have to sort out. Also the pressure, but those two issues are kind of doable at our level of technology. Although, you know, asteroids or moons of Jupiter, they're further away and there isn't as much raw material. So basically that's doable, but more in the future. It's more of a nightmare. Uh, Mars is kind of acceptably hot. So uh, you have a plan called the Mars Drive 3.0. Can you explain how you came up with it and what's uh, how it works? Sure. Um, well, I'll have to be quick on that last part because, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, long. But I started watching videos about uh, Dr. Suprins' Mars Direct in around 2016 or something. He has a, a great documentary called The Mars, the Mars Underground, uh, which I rewatched the other day. It's still quite good. And then, you know, uh, a few years later in 2019, he made a, an update called uh, Mars Direct. Two, which was uh, an expansion of SpaceX's, basically a mixture sort of of SpaceX's plan with Starship and Mars Direct One, um, and uh, so I watched I watched the uh, thing, and there was also another story going on at the same time. It's kind of weird because before that, I I actually once uh, tweeted at. A Dr. Subrin, if he wanted to come to Spain to give some talks, and um, he said that if uh, you know if we got the money, we could, we could do it, and that ended up with me joining the Mars Society Spain, and and then I have a a Twitter account called SpaceX in Sp in Spanish, where I translate all the um, you know the SpaceX information and, and that stuff into Spanish. So I, he then followed me, and we kind of started uh, some uh, DMs. Um, well, basically, uh, we have Mars Society uh, European Convention 2019, which was in London. And by that time, I was studying in, in Southampton. I was uh, studying aerospace uh, engineering back then. So it was uh, somewhat near near me. And so I went, I went there, uh, actually as a representative of the Mars Society of Spain. And before going, I, I told um, Dr. Subrin that, well, I mean, that I did not agree with his plan. Uh, he basically in Mars Direct 2 explained that SpaceX should develop a mini Starship um, because basically the energy needs. And uh, he also had another reason that I don't, I can't re explain it quite well, but I, I didn't agree with it uh, that much. So I thought that it wasn't worth it, the development of that new vehicle just the energy energy cost and i thought the other reason was not as powerful um so i, I kind of I actually offered to debate him but there wasn't time in the schedule in, in the end but after i came back i remember i was in in my kind of one person room in in southampton and i was thinking about the idea about uh my direct two and kind of the problems i saw with it and then I started kind of ideas started popping in my head about how to solve the problems that I saw with with the plan. And then it started growing and growing and growing until I had, you know, I was laying in bed, you know, uh, moving around from one place to another until at 4 a.m. I, I was like, OK, it's, it's done. And then the next day I wrote it in a, in a Word file, uh, in an, uh, yeah, Office Word. And that, that was it for many months until in August 2020, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, the convention for the Mass Society that year was going to be online, and they had an open, open call for papers. So I wrote, hey, I've got, I mean, I'm actually a, a bit daring. I called it Mass Direct 3 since the beginning uh, to make a bit more of an impact. Um, Later, Subrin Super gave me permission, but, but or, originally I just did it because, uh, you know, because it was based on, on Dr. Sugar's plan and basically to get a bit more, more attention. But they actually let me present it. Um, you know, the presentation is still online. If you look at Mars Direct 3 on YouTube right now, it's the first result. But even though it's it's a bit um, outdated because it was kind of the beta version, let's say, there wasn't any almost any calculations yet. I had based on uh, a few of those in, in all people's calculations. 
uh, but the the general idea was there. Then uh, I used that account, SpaceX in Spanish, to get two animators to do the animations for for Mars Direct Three, which was great. Uh, uh, Gustavo Ivon and Juan Rodriguez, uh, they worked really, really great, and I'm very thankful. Um, maybe people are watching some of the animations right now, because I will get them to you after after the interview. Uh, but yeah, so I presented it, and there was you know decent decent success. Uh, I asked I asked Supern about it, and he said it was interesting. He asked one question, you know, uh, he's not like overly enthusiastic about it. Uh, he doesn't comment much, but given how critical he is of all the people's his plans, <clears throat> Artemis, uh, he has a very low tolerance for bullshit. So I consider interesting from him as a huge, a huge accomplishment. Um, yeah, and he also gave me permission to use the name. So like, that's great. That's great. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, a few months uh, passed, and I—I uh, I mean, some people interviewed me. You know, uh, after the original presentation, the people from Total Space Network contacted me, and they were very helpful. And then there was a the time to do the 2021 presentation, uh, the Mount Society. So I decided to try again, but I wasn't going to present the same thing as I did last year. And I knew there was one thing that was missing for from Mars R3, and it was the actual calculations because it, Mars R3 promises a lot. But the, you know, rational people are, are like, hmm, this sounds good, but does it actually work? Does it hold up with, with the numbers? And if I, if I can't back it up, it's just, you know, it's thin air, it's nothing. So uh, for some time, I tried to get someone to do the calculations for me, someone who actually kind of was an engineer. Uh, but I ended up just, you know, I've got to do it myself. So the calculations were not that hard. It was just, you know, some time and refinement. And I did some tweaks based on, on some feedback. And I presented it again. There were some difficulties in the, in the second presentation. But I got, I got the, the paper kind of published. It's sort of published. It's not peer-reviewed, but it's published in the Mars Society, the, the Mars Papers or Mars Archive or something like that. So... Uh, the link is, is public and everyone can read it. Uh, yeah, that's that's more or less the, the story of Master at 3. Great. And uh, you're talking about how you got Zubrin. I also I also have had uh, Zubrin on his channel, which oh, is that's great. Great. And, it, and it's really it's really funny. He had a similar reaction when I asked him about one of my ideas, which was like an air breathing starship system. And he said it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't. He said on a super heavy, it makes no sense, but on a starship or Earth to Earth yeah. transport, it might work. But yeah, he is very critical of other people's ideas. Yeah. When you get interesting, you know you've you know you've hit you've hit the goal. <laughs> <laughs> and I also uh, put a link in the description to to your uh, presentation on Mars Direct Three. Thank you. Uh, so, what's your thoughts on the idea of uh, like the recent design changes on Starship? and Elon Musk's uh, Starship presentation? I, I'm going to start with, late, with the latter part. I was, um, let's say, there were two parts of me watching. One of them was, I want this plan to, this thing to succeed however it is. But another, you know, the selfish part was like, I hope there's not any revolutionary change that basically means Mars Direct 3 is worthless now. Um, and thankfully for that part, the presentation was just, you know, kind of a thing for the public and there wasn't anything that was really, really new or revolutionary. So I was kind of relieved on that front. Uh, yeah, it was a cool presentation, but there was nothing, there wasn't too much substance compared to the previous presentations, let's say. So I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> so... The reason for the design changes is it's two reasons. One, the reason uh, Subin pointed out, which was uh, the, the amount of energy that's required to refuel a starship on Mars is huge, huge. For some strange reason, I've used similar calculations to him and all the people, and the energy requirements have been different in every calculation, even though 
it's a bunch of operations, but they're, they're not difficult. You just have to kind of multiply and divide, and that's kind of the, the top difficulty. You just have to know what to multiply and what to divide, and get a few numbers from uh, NASA websites, and that's basically basically it. But for some reason, uh, the result is, is different. Uh, in, in any case, it's a lot of energy, and using a smaller version could could uh, really serve a lot. And the second is security. I uh, after you know finding a few ways to optimize you know the, the use of, of the mini starship, I started thinking of ways to make the actual mission because SpaceX has not at least publicly uh, they have not disclosed too much about the plan. It's basically get the starship to Mars, get CO two from the atmosphere, ice from the ground. Saboteur plus electrolysis with you know a bunch of solar panels, you're you you get yourself refueled and go back to Earth and that's it. That's basically it. I don't know if they have some secret, not publicly disclosed, uh, more in depth plan. Uh, that would be a bit weird because Elon Musk's companies tend to be actually too public about their plans. So, and every time they're asked, they say that they're focusing on the Starship. And not, you know, doing too much in terms of what actually to do when they get to Mars, which, if true, Mars RT just comes to cover that part, at least for the first one mission and maybe two or three. So, uh, basically, I can't go into all of them, but basically, it's four, four ships get to Mars in Mars RT3. And in different circumstances, like three of them could crash. There can be a, a global dust storm that covers the entire planet. Even if they only have solar panels, they can survive and they, they can come back. It's, you know, it's resilient to almost every possible conceivable thing that can go wrong, you know, with the ex obvious ex exception of the ship the astronauts are going in blows up. I, can, I, I just can't do magic. I cannot save them from that. But almost every other conceivable thing that could go wrong uh, it's, it's accounted for, and there's a backup plan for that. It's contingency after contingency after contingency, and most of that is allowed by, not just by using uh, the mini starship, uh, I renamed it the Carvel ship. Uh, I also put names to, you know, the, all of the, the ships to make it easier to distinguish them from one another. Uh, so, it's one of the innovations for Mars Direct 2 is, is having mini starship but not just using the mini starship, but also the starship for cargo to Mars. Because if you have a smaller ship, yes, you need less fuel and thus less energy, but you also have less cargo capacity uh, and less volume capacity, which is also important. But the only problem with starship on Mars is the return. If you use it and just leave it there, it's, it's no problem uh, at all. So if you have the advantage of the large cargo and volume of the big starship and the small energy and fuel requirements of the small uh, ship, that's a huge advantage. And it, it allows you to take a lot of mass, of mass to Mars and do more with less energy and more fuel. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's basically the, the dynamic and the idea of, of Mars direction and, and why I think it, it's useful. Uh, and the, the reason I think it's worth it is because it's a lot safer. And I think uh, if someone uh, thinks they can debug me, I would be thank thankful if someone debugged me uh, because I don't want to have a, a wrong idea. But yeah, the, the ship the design is not too different from uh, a big starship, and it, it will also it's a lot easier to make. Let me rephrase it. The mini starship, even though it's quite, it's significantly smaller than the, the starship, it would still be, it would still require a huge uh, life support system. Uh, that's something SpaceX has not developed because uh, the, sorry, the life support system that SpaceX has designed for Dragon is short term. They would need to do a uh, completely new design for for the Starship. So even the mini Starship already require the largest uh, life support system ever. Like maybe the one in the ISS would be larger, but this would be like one ship and it would not restock for a long time. So if even the mini Starship is going to require the, larger, the largest ever, which is always expensive, imagine the Starship. Like that's going to be huge. 
Uh, uh, so yeah, that, I, I think it's going to have uh, some, uh, actually money, it's going to be money saving in some areas. Uh, and, you know, combining all of that, if, if it's safer, uh, and remember, the safety is not is not just good because you know the lives of the astronauts, but this is going to be a global event. It's going to be a myth. So if it fails and the people and people watch the astronauts die, that's going to be horrific, like horrendous, hideous for for uh, for the morale of you know the entire planet. It has to go right. And then if it's not too too expensive, you know, if the marginal the only cost is not too big and it's safer. Well, it's probably kind of worth it, I think. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's a Don't little worry. bit of a distraction in the background. Uh, so you're talking about the uh, small scale Starship. Uh, how about the manufacturing of them? Uh, on one hand, you have two different vehicles you have to manufacture, but on the other hand, it's also much smaller material, meaning less material has to be manufactured. Uh, well, I mean, from a manufacturing perspective, it's obviously going to be a bit more complex than just developing one vehicle, that's obvious. But it, is it the right decision? Can, can it be replaceable? As, as Elon likes to say, uh, the best part is no part. Is is, is it worth it? That's basically the question. And the answer is, it depends. How much does it deliver? How much does it improve the vision? And how much does it uh, cost incrementally? So I've tried to get something that delivers quite a lot and at the same time, make the extra cost smaller. It's obviously going to be uh, more complex to develop two vehicles than one. But if you basically use the same engine, which is the most complex part, it's if it, it uses Raptors. And uh, I invented the Raptor Junior engine because SpaceX has not given a name to the engine that's going to be in the Lunar Starship, you know, with a retro landing. And uh, so I, I just called it a Raptor Junior. And even if it had to be a, a newly developed, it could even be shit efficient. It could be a very bad engine as long as it's somewhat reliable. Uh, well, well as, as, it, as it's reliable, you know, uh, that would be the only thing because the steel would be the same, the heat shield would be the same, the even the software could be uh, quite similar. Okay. So, uh, fully and rapidly reusable rockets is considered by many to be the holy grail of rocketry. What do you think would be the next big step in rocketry after fully and rapidly reusable rockets? Uh, well, first of all, I, I completely agree. I think everything uh, SpaceX is doing is, is great with, with Starship. You know, it's, it's, if it works well, it's going to be absolutely a revolutionary. Uh, actually, I, I heard a, uh, some rumors on the Twitter, I think it was yesterday, that some NASA, the NASA officials are afraid that Starship is going to outcompete every single rocket and that they're going to become kind of a monopoly. Uh, that's how good they think it's going to be if it works. So, yeah, because, uh, some people criticize me because they think there might be some tribalism in here. It's ha it has happened to me before that I, you know, I'm so in love with the idea of, you know, going to Mars, SpaceX, Starship, that any kind of criticism kind of hurts, you know. Uh, and some people perceive me as a, a critic or something because I think the SpaceX plan needs to change in this, you know, this kind of small way. Uh, and then implement this whole thing that's not, I'm not changing, most of Mars Directory is not changing SpaceX is fun, but actually expanding it, you know? Uh, the only kind of change would be, hey, I think we could actually use the, the mini Starship as well. But the mini, two things, in Master you also use the Starship, and uh, the mini Starship is launched on a Starship. So, like, Starship is absolutely crucial in any way, and I also made a version with only Starships, which I think is more complex, and I, I think the look at the mini Starship would be worth it. Uh, but... Mars Direct 3 also works without the, the mini Starship. But uh, the next step after fully reusable rockets, I think it's going to be launching from other planets. Because after, I mean, you, for some time, there's going to be incremental improvement in, uh, in, make, in uh, fully reusable rockets. There's going to be, you know, decent improvement there. Then some on-orbit assembly of larger things that could not be launched in, in, in one launch. 
the next step is getting rid of the Earth's gravity, gravity well, which is huge. So if you start having a decent basis on, on the Moon and Mars, and you start launching stuff from there, uh, that's a lot easier in, del in terms of Delta V. So you could get a lot more mass further away. And if you combine that with, you know, some nuclear engines, uh, I'm not I'm not an expert in engines, but there are actually some people not working not just on nu you know nuclear thermal engines, which uh, work on fission, but actually fusion engines. That would be that would be huge. So I cannot predict the, the evolution and development of those kinds of engines. It, it also depends quite a lot in how much uh, investment goes into that, uh, as with everything. But aside from you know that engine engine thing, the next step is having bases that are so advanced on all the planets or you know all the moon that you can actually start launching stuff stuff directly from there and if if the economy starts revolving around mining the asteroids mars is closer to the asteroid belt and it has almost no atmosphere to slow the vehicle down by launches and uh, the the orbital velocity and the escape velocity are lower so everything is be better by launching uh, from Mars and then launching from asteroids. But that's, as uh, the audience can imagine, that's quite a lot in the future. So there's going to be a lot of time be before we have something as revolutionary as fully reusable vehicles. Those are, I think, the, the next steps. As I said, unless there is some you know, miraculous development in, in engines regarding probably uh, nuclear engines, because with chemical engines, we're probably... Uh, near the top of the efficiency. Uh, we're nearing the maximum theoretical efficiency of uh, chemical engines. So yeah, either great nuclear engines or then we or else we have to wait until we have colonized the moon or, or Mars. Great. Uh, they had a lot of interesting to say, uh, a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, and uh, what is your message uh, for like students who want to work in the STEM field? Well, I'm, I'm one of them. So <laughs> I um, I have two, adva one advantage and one disadvantage here. One is that, you know, it, this question is usually asked to people who, have, who are already successful in the field or, you know, they're successful in communicating science. So they, they might be subject to sur survivorship bias and I'm not, so that's good. But on the other side, I haven't made it to the other side yet, so my my answer is as good as anyone else's. But my my advice would be know yourself, know where you where you'd be satisfied satisfied being. Uh, that might not be you know an immediate answer, but if you start watching yourself and watching what you enjoy, what you're good at, then you know you kind of probably will get there. Also, if if you have kind of an open mind. In, in, I'm told that when, when you get to work, you can change positions until you are in a good spot. Uh, it's great for, for you to be in a position where you can do your best and are happy, and that's good for you and for your employer. So it's in everyone's interest to get you where you can be the most useful. And in terms of studying, I mean, the, the, the world is changing a bit. Uh, Official titles are worth less today than yesterday, but they're still valuable. So it depends on where, where you want to work. It, they might matter more or less. And also work on your social skills because they're very, very important to, you know, if you can write well, speak well, and be confident, you're gonna get a lot higher and you will be able to communicate a lot better what you want and what your values are. And, uh, you know, 50% or more of work, well, it depends on, on what uh, job you have, is interacting with all people. So if you, if you become good at that, you will become valuable. And wherever you're studying, you're pro probably going to get higher. But I hope that collection of different thoughts kind of combines into a useful uh, way of understanding that. But as I said, I haven't tested it yet because I'm still, a, you know, a student, actually an economic student, hoping to get into something re uh, related to science. So it's it's complicated and I hope uh, life finds a way for me and for, for you and for people watching. 
Thank you so much for coming on. It was a great privilege to have you on. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of great and amazing answers. And your uh, Mars Direct 3.0 is idea, I think, is great and very inspiring. Thank so, I think, how, how did you get to do it? Oh, so um, I I was recommend. I'm part of the Mars Society, so I was recommended it. The Mars Direct 3.0. I saw it through like the uh, Mars Society. Oh, that's that's great. So uh, thanks for um, coming on. Thank you. Okay, that's it for today's video. Thank you so much, Miguel Gorea, for coming on the channel. It was a great privilege to have you on. And thank you so much for my viewers for watching this video, as always. And uh, of course, have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.